Welcome to chapter two of the book, What Happened to You, by Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Bruce Perry. And we are going to start off this quick lecture, mini lecture series with, with what chapter two is all about. And it really is a chapter on loving and being loved. So as you can see here, we love how we were loved. And this is what this chapter talks about. So the way in which we end up loving people and loving ourselves and just expressing love is heavily dependent on how we were loved, whether or not we were loved. Okay. And it also goes on to say here that we are relational beings. Okay. So as human beings, we, we are deeply rooted to how we relate with each other. So how we relate with each other, especially in the formative years, informs how we develop and the kind of people we become. And so there was a definition. It wasn't really a definition in the book about um, what the definition of love is, but it's a, really a key of what constitutes love is were you given care? Were the people that were taking care of you, were they really giving you warm care? Did you feel care for? And did they meet your specific needs? That's really the main point of, of, of what they're trying to drive here with as being relational and how we are related to as children affects how we become. Okay. And then the next bit of point that I want to get into is the malleability of the brain. The fact that the brain is malleable speaks to how, when we are still very young and in those formative years, how we are impacted, affected by how we are raised and the conditions around that. But it also speaks to how we can change even those things that we think that are hardwired, that we, uh, we think that we've been born that way, there's nothing that can be done. The brain is really malleable. And a term that they introduce here is neuroplasticity. Being plastic in, in medical terms basically means that something can change from one form to another. So we, the, the, the hard wires that have been formed, the neural networks that have been formed due to our childhood and the things that we've been through, they can be rewritten. They can be changed. And the, the way in which we change that is through repetition. We have to repeat. We have to, number one, recognize that what, uh, how we've been raised is not serving us in a certain way. It's tripping us up. It's, it's uh, costing us relationships, our well-being, all of those things. We have to recognize the negative impact of how we are and what happened to us. And then after you recognize that, you then get education or information about how best to go forward with that. And once you've got the strategy, you repeat. You keep repeating that. You take specific actions and you keep on repeating them so that you can see the malleability of your or the changeability of your brain. Okay. So in that way, in the spirit of this chapter of love, we see that um, your specific needs, in order for your specific needs to be met, right, you need to explore and express what those are. Okay, so that's that whole process of you seeing that, okay, this is what I was missing in life, or I don't know what is it, what love is to me. I, do, I cannot articulate it. I don't know how to love myself or the next person. The definition of love to me is very vague. So that's where you now uh, undertake to say, okay, I'm going to explore uh, my specific needs. What needs do I need? What makes me feel fulfilled? If someone does this, then they meet a specific need. So then we explore what that is. And once we've gotten that, we express it. And if we are able to express the specific needs for ourselves, when we can express it and articulate it, then we can request and we can require other people to meet our needs. Okay. So in the way that we, we, we bring this about is by practicing. We have to teach us our brain, ourselves, what love is all over again. Love was supposed to be care and your needs being met. So then in order to arrive at that place, if you then look at your life and you look at your situation, how you've been, how you, uh, what you've been through, and you see that there's a lot of self-love lacking or the practice of love, receiving and giving love for me is not quite put together. You see that love for you is not really practiced. So then you find out and you practice and you teach your brain through repetition and specific action over and over again that, oh, this is what love is. And then you learn how to give love. And then you also love how to feel it. You learn how to feel it because a lot of the times 
um, we don't even know what the feeling is and we have to teach our our brain and ourselves how to feel love and how to give love to other people so for some of us we have no problem giving love but we have a problem receiving it or feeling it so then we have to teach our brain that because our brains can be taught some of us can feel the love but we have difficulties giving love to others so it's something that we needed to be to have been taught by being modeled by our primary caregivers and if something went amiss there then we end up being adults that have issues with giving or feeling love so whichever it is that you may struggle with you have to then pinpoint what that is and then pinpoint also the, spe the the practical steps that you need to do to teach your brain anew what love really is because we are not just born knowing that it has to be modeled by our primary caregivers by the way they treat us the way they care for us and the way they meet our needs and our needs could be how when your basic needs when you are hungry when you are when you are cold or you're thirsty when when you're in pain how do they respond do they do they meet those needs and if they did that in a consistent manner and all of those things that and you associate who and what they were their smell their sight and the environments around that you associate that with pleasure with goodness you associate that with love and that's how the, the love is formed as human beings and how that is formed is then how we love and we accept love so if any of that is is tempered with or not properly administered to us we then struggle in the area of love Next, we are going to discuss how caregivers influence our worldview. So depending on how you were cared for and how you were treated in the formative years, in the very early days, that informs how you see the world. Either the world is a threatening place, a safe place, or you think school, like in the example in the book, school is, is, is where I meet all my friends, it's fun, or school is where my friends die. I think that's one of the examples that they gave. And, you know, love is, whether love generally or love in relationships based on how your caregivers modeled and the environment you were living in, they form your worldview, your current worldview of what love is, is shaped by your caregivers, your primary caregivers. Your attitude about money, your attitude about career, and just the world in general. So that is how important a caregiver is. Because they actually have the power to influence your whole world view. Okay, so we are going to go into how then, well, how, depending on how you were raised, either your caregivers were constructive in the way that they, they raised you, either they were uh, constructive or they were they were destructive. The characteristics of caregivers that are really raising you in a uh, constructive way is that they they elicit pleasure, there's warmth, they give you love, they provide for you food-wise, all your needs are met and that feels really warm, fuzzy and you are really surrounded by pleasure and all those good stuff. Now a destructive way of, of being raised by your caregivers is where there's neglect, there's violence, there's confusion, there's aggression, all those negative stuff. So if your caregivers exhibited any of those destructive side, then they they also informed how you view the world. Okay. And, and so again, not just what is it that they did, the characteristics of a of a of a constructive caregiver. There's also the manner in which they delivered those because sometimes somebody can be supportive of you but if the support is inconsistent then it's not constructive to you it can actually be it leads to unpredictability so we see with constructive caregiving that the manner in which they give the the, the warmth the provision the meeting of your needs and the love that they have and the support and all of that the manner in which they do that it will be uh, attentive consistent it will be predictable they are very responsive and they are there's a playfulness to it and there's a lot of tenderness in all of that right so those are the the types of of environments where a child can thrive and they learn love and they learn how to relate with love and they really become a well-rounded human being who actually can deal with stress and can deal with their strength and this love, attentiveness, all of those things, all these things that we put around a child, it strengthens them to be able to deal with whatever that life uh, throws at them because then they are strong from within. And then whatever it is that we give to them, they later on learn to do it for themselves. 
Okay, then when we come to the destructive side, the manner in which the neglect, violence, confusion, and even some of the good stuff, sometimes if it's chaotic or if it's a threatening environment, the love or the provision or the, the warmth is unpredictable or the manner in which they, they, they relate to you as a child is cold, detached, rigid, or even harsh, that actually chips away at the worldview of a child and how they, and their capacity to love, to, to love other people and to be loved, to receive love. So that is how the manner in which we are uh, loved or raised impacts us. Those are the two main ones. Now we move on to how stress and challenges were presented to a child who now has been, we are going to compare them with the constructive way of caregiving to a child in the formative years versus a child who grew up in destruction, in chaos, and in just uh, violence, aggression, all of the, in confusion. So what that leads is, as long as a child has moderate, predictable, and controllable stresses or challenges, right, those, that child can thrive. Their, their stress response becomes flexible, it becomes strong, they can come, they become resilient, meaning that they can bounce back from a bad thing relatively quickly, and they can really be restored back to their default setting, which is a calm person or a person that, that can really go back to their true self. So, if the, the, the stresses and challenges in their lives are moderate, predictable, and they are within their control, remember that that control is built by how the manner in which they are raised and the characteristics of their caregivers. So what that does, it ensures that because life will happen and we will go through stresses and challenges and problems, then a child that's raised in this way, their problems and their stresses become moderate, predictable, and controllable. As long as that child is raised around those types of things, then they, their ability to respond to stress, their stress response system is flexible, it is strong, it is resilient, and it helps them bounce back. Okay, and their mental health is, is really in, in top shape. Now, with a destructive upbringing, what happens is the stresses and challenges of life become when they are ex extreme and controllable and they are prolonged. We are looking back into their childhood and they are threatening and whatever is going on in the home is really unpredictable. That leads to a stress response system that is weak and that is really susceptible to, to mental issues. Because you cannot, you do not have the systems in place to make sure that when you do have a stress in your life, you have a well thought out system on how to manage, how to process and how to recover. So because of all of that, then you are adversely um, affected by those experiences. So then your, your, your surrounding, when it's extreme and it's violent and all of those things, it really weakens your ability to manage stress, to manage disaster and catastrophe. Next, we are discussing how the brain functions depends on us, depending on our state. So this means that our brain function in certain ways when we are in different states compared to other states. So we need to understand how our brain functions so that we can understand ourselves and maybe even other people better. So we are going to look at these five states when we are calm when we are alert when we are alarmed when we are in fear and when we are in terror because the way in which our brain reacts in each of these states is very different and very telling and very revelatory in in how the brain reacts to all these states so it's very important for us to know and understand this so that we can a pinpoint what state we are in so that we can really be invested in knowing what state we are in and B, um, be able to, to now understand ourselves better and even other people to understand that when, when we are in interactions with other people, um, what states are we likely in and what states are they likely in. So we are going to start with a, with a, calm, with a calm state. The calm state is really where it, you know, it is self-explanatory in a sense that um, it's speaking about, about um, us being, we have access to our smartest brain. So when we are calm, uh, the smartest part of our brain is on 
high alert, where you can make rational decisions, you can make calculated, th things make sense. So we have access to our smartest brain. This is the height of our problem solving and our rational thinking. So we are at our most rational when we are calm, we can solve problems, our solutions are well thought out. We really are our smartest when we are calm. Okay, and then our mind also tends to drift and wander because it's really um, a good state to be in for lack of a, of a better word. And then comes what happens to us when we are in an alert state. What causes us to be alert? We, you know, we, when something happens, we pay more attention. When we pay more attention, remember that in a calm state, we tend to, to relax and wander off, you know, we drift our way, we are imaginative, we can even be, if you are calm enough, you can, it's very easy to, to drift into imaginations and all of those stuff. But when we are alert is when we are now paying more attention to our external world. This is where we have our conversation, we're very conversational when you, in order to, to, to have a, a conversation with somebody, you need to be somewhat alert, you can't be drifting off and daydreaming when you're having a conversation with someone. So when we are conversational, we are more alert. And then, so when we are regulated and we are balanced and we have found that we know our stress response system is resilient, most of our days we will spend being just alert or some combination of alert and calm. So when we are people whose stress regulatory system is resilient, it's flexible, it's very strong. We spend most of our days in, alert, in the alert state or the calm state. Okay, so now we move to the alarmed state. Now, this is very important to know when are we in alarm state. We are in alarm state when we are challenged, when we are surprised, meaning good or bad. Right. So whenever we are surprised, we are hyper alert and hyper alarmed. Right. And then when we feel threatened, it causes us to be alarmed. What happens here? We tend to have emotional thinking. So that's when our emotion starts to kick in versus our rationale and our problem solving. So now emotional thinking starts to enter the chat and our lower part of our brain system starts to now dominate our functioning. So we are now starting to function on that primitive brain, which is all about survival because we are startled, we are challenged, we are threatened. You know, we feel, we feel like we need to, to find a way to stabilize ourselves and to survive. So now our lower part of our brain system starts to dominate the functioning of the brain. Our conversations now, we could have a proper rational conversation when we are calm or we are alert, but now when we are alarmed, our conversation now regresses to arguments. We are now in argument mode that is activated. And then when we get into that, our arguments now start to be attack. We start to attack the person that we are speaking with. And those attacks, they become erosive as we use personal and emotional attacks. So whenever someone is emotionally attacking you or you are emotionally or personally attacking someone, you need to know that this person was challenged, surprised or threatened in some way, shape or form. So that's what I want us to, to, to differentiate between these two. That's what happens. Because sometimes you may be calm and you may be dealing with someone who's, in, who's alarmed by whatever you said in your calm state or vice versa. Someone might be very calm and based on your triggers, that might actually trigger you. And then you start now being defensive and personally attacking them and using emotional attacks. So in this alarmed state, we act less and less matured, okay? And we tend to say and do things that we regret. And then we get to our fear state, right? With our fear state, what happens with our fear state is we are now accessing even the, the lowest part of our brains. And if you remember from other chapters, that is the most primitive. It's really black and white. It does not know concept of time. It's reactive. It's, you know, it reacts without thinking. And when we are in fear mode, they really, that's where our reflexes now start kicking in, 
right? So now those even lower brain parts start to dominate our functions, right? Things that are memorized, think instinct, think survival, those ones are dominating how we are acting, right? So here, problem solving is at its lowest or non-existent. When we're in fear mode, you cannot solve a problem. You do not have time to solve a problem. You just need to put into action a routine or an instinct that you have installed into your brain and it's time for action. Okay, so now again, if problem solving is at its lowest, then you are, our, when we are in fear, our rational thinking is shut down. We are hyper-focused on the threat because when you are in fear, you are, you are perceiving something as a threat. So we are hyper-focused on the threat in the moment. Okay, and time does not exist. And really, terror is nothing more than just our fear worsened. Okay, so this is how our brain functions. And it is very important for us to understand, to be very well versed as we are knowing ourselves. That w when am I calm? Can I sense when I'm calm, when I'm alert, when I'm alarmed in fear and in terror? And to understand how our brain works, because we tend to think we are just this one person or maybe two states. Either I'm OK or I'm not OK. So I want us to start um, differentiating between the different states and to understand how our brain works. We do not uh, have the same parts of the brain activated throughout our lives or throughout a situation. It depends on our state. So if we understand this, then we can understand why people say the things or why we say things or do things that we regret because we were in that mode in, in in alarm mode you know we can we can see how how then that when when our thinking is shut down when our critical thinking is shut down we were likely in fear we get to understand ourselves better and then act accordingly right then if we know that i'm in fear and we are aware of it there's certain things that we can do to regulate ourselves so that we are moving further and further away from that state so that we can access the part of our brain that is smart and we can say things that are helping the discussion or the, the conversation. We can do things that are actually rational and that are helping the situation instead of just being reactive and being primitive and being in survival mode. So it is very important that we know all these states and we can recognize ourselves, how we tend to act in each state so that we can regulate ourselves back into the calm and alert state so that we can better look at other situations that we are dealing with. So now we respond to trauma in two ways, right? We either respond to trauma in an adaptive way or in a maladaptive way. So when we are dealing with um, adaptive Trauma, and you see it here in green, to, ad to show that trauma is part of life. We cannot um, say that we will not uh, face some difficulty, some stress, you know, or some challenges, right? But if we, the, the adaptive way is the way in which it ensures that we are surviving in the moment. So it judges the situation we are in and the way our bodies adapt ensures our survival it defends us. It's a way in which our body responds to defend us when we're speaking about dissociating. That dissociating or, or defending yourself can be even in fighting. So it is it is an adapt, adaptive way that ensures that everything you need to defend and fight off a threat. Your muscles are, are, are being given food. Your, your, your sugar level is high. And you are, your pupils are dilated, your vision is, is sharpened so that you can be able to, to defend yourself. Either you defend by fighting back or by fleeing, you know, and you will need muscles and good vision for that. So the way in which we respond to trauma again can keep us safe. Okay, again, that could be in running away or even in dissociating. Dissociation keeps us safe. Okay, and it minimizes pain and injury. And this is what we've learned from dissociating that when we see that we cannot win a fight, we are too small to win a fight. We then, our brain, our system is set up in such a way that we, there's pain killers released. The body prepares itself for injury. So it minimizes pain and injury in that you get pain, uh, pain your natural painkillers come into your blood so that whatever blow that you've been dealt, 
you will not feel the pain. That's why people can be shot and stabbed and they don't feel anything because the body saw that coming and it produced natural painkillers so that you can survive that. And then we've also seen with dissociation that your brain, you dissociate from the external world and you, you retreat into an inner world so that you don't experience the gravity of the situation so that you may survive it, right? And then this then is... The way an adaptive response to trauma is, it's very much appropriate to the current situation. So it's there to minimize, to keep you safe, to keep you alive, to keep you sane even. So it's very much appropriate to whatever is going on at that moment. Okay, then we have the maladaptive response to trauma. And what that really is, it is a fear or terror-based response that meets daily challenges. So you get... Things that should be daily challenges and on a light level and the way in which we respond to them is way bigger than what the situation warranted. So you use terror responses, the responses that are appropriate for terror or fear on something that is really light. So that is maladaptive. So then you're not adapting well to the current situation that you're going through. So you'll find somebody maybe having anger bursts or just switching off when you speak, you know, because maybe you've triggered something, there's a hot spot and they tend to switch off or they redirect it. They don't want to talk about that. So they, they change the subject quickly as a, as a preventative or a protective me me uh, mechanism against whatever this, the, the discussion is or the situation is so that they don't have to go through the pain. Whereas that situation could very, very much be a very light day-to-day -day conversation or situation. So that the response that someone has when they are responsible to, 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 to trauma is maladaptive, that response is a misfit to the current situation. So the current mild situation is linked now or associated with a similar tragic one. So you will see that just a slight similarity in something that's tragic then triggers the person to overreact, to be overstimulated, to react in a way that is really injured as if they are back to that tragic situation when the current situation really wasn't that big. And that's how we adapt to, to, to trauma. That's really the conclusion of chapter two. Let us meet each other again in chapter three.